Good afternoon, Dennis, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on another edition of Condo Insider. It's great to see everybody and have you here. Um, welcome, Dennis. Dennis is with La Lima Asset Management. Um, it is a wonderful new company. It's very refreshing. They're taking some things to a, a, a really nice level for condos. And um, we're going to talk a little bit today about what exactly they do a little bit. Um, but they also are going to be at our next seminar, which is on August 24th, Thursday. Um, the flyers have already gone out to a lot of the management companies. It's already been distributed, but we're going to be doing another distribution soon. So, um, Dennis, thank you and welcome to the show. Yes, and thank you for having me. I look forward to our conversation. So explain a little bit about what asset, a La Lima Asset Management does. Well, we are a, a, an asset management company. We're dealing with a number of issues for what we call aged condominium buildings. Uh, we're, we're not really involved in new uh, condominiums. Uh, we're mostly involved with buildings that are 40 to 45, 50 years old that are sort of in this sort of second phase of life, uh, we'll say. And what happens at that point in time is that there are a lot of uh, building components that are starting to wear out, we'll say. It's, it's almost an analogy like human beings. You know, buildings aren't built to last forever. Uh, neither are human beings. The, the, the magic number for both is about 80 years. So at a certain point in time, we have to do things to, our, to ourselves physically to maintain ourselves. The same thing happens in buildings as well. So we started getting involved with these older buildings to help them sort of take on the next phase of life. So we feel that that with these buildings, there are many aspects that are have changed over four or five decades, and that 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 the financial aspect of an aged building is much different than the financial aspects of a brand new building, and the commitments that have to be made for the future in order to, to be able to sort of last for another forty or so more years. So we we get involved, uh, help people with the idea of financing and how this would work. Uh, the, the projects are different than than what, a, say, a, a condo association would be dealing with. That say, in the first five years, there's not much to deal with. It's all brand new. But when something's 45 years old, we have three or four many very expensive items that we might be dealing with. But we can't necessarily deal with them all at one time. So, you know, we, we say, here's the, the financial aspects to these things that you're dealing with. Maybe we're going to deal with one or two of these things today. Let's think about what we're going to what we can do down the road, but we have to get these things planned for because as, as time goes along, um, you know, kind of like people, if you don't fix your problems, only things are only going to get worse from there. Like your car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's really interesting. This morning I had um, a, I had to do a Zoom class um, for continuing education for a lot of mortgage professionals and they were all over the country. They were just all spread out all over the country. And um, I, one of the questions I asked, I go, so what's the biggest complication in, the, in your business today? And a lot of them, there was a handful. And I was, I was surprised to see it because it caught my eye, is mm -hmm. doing transaction for condos. Oh. And, and they said deferred maintenance. Right. So everybody, this is not unique to Hawaii. This is impacting everywhere across the country, not just Florida. But these people, I mean, they were like in New Jersey, South Carolina. I mean, they were spread out all over. Texas, I remember, but they were spread out all across the country. I was really surprised at, especially when it, I saw condo and deferred maintenance. I went, oh, I mean, it just kind of like, you know, made my eyes bigger, you know. But, um, but everybody, we really want you to be aware that this is not isolated to Hawaii. This is happening across the country where um, all these units were built. These buildings were built way back when. And um, like I said earlier, it's like, like your car. You can only do Band-Aid fixes for so long, and then you kind of have to like really break down and um, decide to even, I mean, unfortunately a building you can't tear down and rebuild on a condo, um, but you really have to break, um, break down and, you know, gonna have to, I mean, I know some people that took out their engine and replaced it, you know? Because right. it was made more sense. They loved their car, but it was just, you know, but um, with a building, you can only do Band-Aids for so long. And that's, that's it's correct. a bigger, bigger problem, right? Right. I'm, I'm an architect by trade. And basically, uh, it, when you follow the sort of the history of buildings, 
basically modern buildings sort of came into existence after World War II. And then a lot of buildings were built by developers. So these buildings get built from a, from a return on investment. So we don't, we, we, we haven't built buildings to last for 200 years, like you might find in Europe and whatnot. So, so what we, what we're, we're faced with is the construction is fine, but it was never intended to last 100 years or 150 years. But we can make it last 100 years if we get on board, and especially with new technologies today, if we get on board with making those repairs, we have new ways of fixing things. We have new materials. So it's actually, uh, we, we have a great opportunity to extend the lifetime of these particular buildings. And then, you know, in, in Honolulu, it's, it would be tough to, you know, there's some areas in Waikiki, how would you take that building down safely as, as packed in as it, it can be and stuff? So there's a lot of reasons to believe that this is something that, you know, that we have to be able to turn around. Maybe, you know, a, a similar case might be like if you've ever gone to Florida down in South Beach, there was a time there when, you know, the that, that area, the Art Deco area was kind of going downhill and all of a sudden it got rejuvenated. People started fixing up their buildings and, and we're kind of in that kind of renaissance opportunity with our buildings that are now in that 50 year old um, sort of group of, of buildings right now. High rise really didn't start till the 60s in, in Hawaii. Yeah, because there's no way you can, I mean, you're going to displace hundreds of people, um, several hundred, you know, and think about that Kapilani block where they're trying to de yeah. demo those. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I can, I feel for them. So that's why, you know, as condos, you know, I mean, you're going to be faced like them. How are you going to put all these other people into another location? Because you demoed your building to build back new and, and, and economically or uh, financially, that, that's like impossible. Right, right. And so that's, that's where, you know, where we come into play, you know, we're able to, you know, we work on buildings, we do project management, so we're able to, you know, do the help people with the construction fixes. But also in the long term, you know, you have, we have to sort of pay attention to trends as well. You know, the cost of electricity is going up when the cost of the barrel of oil goes up, our electric bill goes up. So we're getting more electric vehicles on the road. So how many, you know, charging stations can these condominium buildings hold? Uh, we've got climate change. More buildings want air conditioning to go into their into the units, and so our electrical needs are going up. So there's sort of to make keep these buildings functioning for the long term. Uh, you know, we need to talk about how we can finance things today, the work that we can do today, plan for financing these these opportunities for the future to help the buildings you know survive for the next forty years. Yeah, and you mentioned like um, electric vehicles. I think I saw a snippet you know, where they have the words going across the bottom about um, electric vehicles, not putting them into the garage. I think I saw it. I tried to oh. watch it, but then I had to get online. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot, you know, electricity isn't, isn't for nothing, you know, so you've got the, the charging stations, it's going to occupy a space and, and uh, electricity, you know, on the islands is, gen is, we don't have oil on the island. So it's basically, uh, another electrical need that we're that we have to satisfy on the islands. Yeah, so so I'm just imagining, Dennis. You know, you're working on my well, we're, we're contracting with you to help us with some financing and trying to get our repairs done. How we're gonna how we're gonna do it? How mm -hmm. we're gonna manage that cost? And so, say like part of that repair, our list is involving electrical, because mm -hmm. what electrical sixty years ago? I mean, there's new codes. You know, um, or they could even be be eaten up by rats, and then we got you know another kind of kind of worms to deal with too. But trying to bring electrical up, and maybe okay. So here's a scenario: we want to bring our electrical up. We want to put um, solar on the roof. Right. We also want to consider having the opportunity while we're doing this to do electric charging vehicle stations. Right. Right. So, um, kind of give us a little brief about how you could help us achieve that goal? Well, uh, part of my uh, years of experience in, in construction management was, was working with the Department of Education. Uh, and and uh, a lot of the projects that I worked on, we, the schools were doing the electrical upgrades. And so we found many of the, you know, the systems there because of the, we'll say, uh, you know, sort of, we'll call it aged out. So the electrical needs, we were looking at, you know, putting some air conditioning in the classrooms, we need a, a bigger electrical size for that. We, we're actually 
Uh, you know, we had more electronic needs and whatnot. So basically, there, there's some real basic fixes for most of these issues, like in, as far as the electrical is concerned, most buildings, you know, aged buildings, again, need to increase the size of their electrical service. They're, they're just too small. Uh, HECO is able to do that. It, it does cost money, but it's it's something that, you know, 20 years ago, we all knew what Waikiki looked like, and now 20 years later, it's it has evolved as well. So basically, we all have to evolve with the sign of the times. And you know, electrical is one of those particular things that um, is is going to be a very sensitive issue for a long time to come because of the the high cost of energy. Is that kind of like um, upgrading your electrical meter box? Yes, in a way, right? It's basically. Say if you if you had a hundred amp service, we'll say from a for a home, you're making it two hundred amp service so that you can you know handle twice as much capacity, and and for condominium buildings, you know we 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 have electrical engineers who do the the sizing based upon what those future requirements might be. So we're we'd probably be the upsizing the actual service to be able to handle the future. But right now, uh, you know, these aged buildings, if you haven't upgraded your service is probably maxed out at this point. Well, yeah, because I know in my house, well, Heckle will replace the meter and I had just replaced it too. Got it replaced because I upgraded and then they right. came and gave, us, gave me a new meter. I go, well, could I have not known that ahead of time? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, oh man, I paid for nothing. Uh, yeah. but, um, but I'm sure I mean, it, you know, from a single family, and then you're looking at condo. I'm sure the condos got to upgrade theirs because look at all the window ACs that are getting installed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's going to be a big issue, and and uh, um and it takes time. You know, we you know some of these these um, transformers have expired or are getting close to expiring, and these transformers are made on the you know the mainland. Got to get shipped here, and they've got to get design. We'll say design parameters set up so it you know unfortunately for us on the, on the islands it does take time for all this equipment to get here so there's there's really for for from my way of thinking there's never it's never too early to start working on some of these things in advance of actually doing the actual work because there's a lot of design efforts involved there's permitting delay you know i won't say delays but the time period that it takes to, to get a building permit so if you're thinking about something today you know, getting through the design process, getting through the permitting process, you could, it can take you two to three years to, to be in a position to actually start construction. So, you know, it's, it's, I think condos have to start thinking a little bit more along the lines, moving forward on projects from a design standpoint, maybe you can't afford it just yet on, as far as the construction is concerned, but you don't want to start, find yourselves always starting from scratch trying to meet some kind of demand that's an emergency situation at that point in time. And then the other thing I wanted to point out too is because some of the buildings that were are impacted by the LSE, um, I know some of them have um, gone through um, the design professional. The right. design professional pointed out certain things like front doors, you know, and with these aging buildings, I mean, front doors don't last forever. Um, but eventually you're going to fall off. I know mine fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked. You know, I was really shocked. <laughs> We're all falling apart. <laughs> yeah. And then when it fell apart, I went, oh, these are how they're made. It's not a little, but it's really, you know, those one by one sticks in there. And um, so um, some of these buildings that are at a stage where their front doors are going to need to be replaced, they can take that opportunity from the LSE uh, because the LSE, they're not complying with the LSE about the front doors, to start using La Lima as a means to set up the specs. Yes, yeah, so so there are there are a number of things that uh, uh, that will say there that with the LSE, there is two options for passing the LSE. The first option really involves fire sprinkler systems, and the second system sort of excludes fire uh, sprinkler systems. But requires a number of other features as well. And one one of the things you might be referring to is, for example, uh, doors from the actual condo units themselves all have to have closers on, so they have to close right. by themselves. And that's something that that you know we don't even even necessarily have to be involved with, but we can combine that with some of our projects. But that's that's where an association can hire, a, a, say, a, 
um, almost a handyman in a sense because you just have to spec out the right closer and it's a basically a bunch of screws in the, in the wall that type of thing and the door so that those are things that that where we're, when we're working with an association we say here's how we can do this it doesn't have to be our responsibility but maybe four other things are our responsibility in this process and and so we 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 look to to help the associations help themselves as much as we possibly can and, and come in and help where they really do need some design design and construction yeah to organize them into yep. um like what kind of door can be installed mm -hmm. um, i mean i'm sure it has to be a fire rated door that's um, correct right and correct. um but then but hand, yeah handyman can can install that door easily but it's just telling the homeowner these are the specs for the door these are what needs to be installed to be compliant with lse and we want the doors to be uniform in appearance so at least you can help them say, okay, these are the specs that's required. And it's a door that can easily be purchased at Home Depot or Lowe's, right. one of the two, you right. know, um, we want that for the convenience of it rather than something that has to be shipped in um, or you have to special order, which would be really hard, you know? Yeah, you yeah, know, there are condos that, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, where the owners actually own the windows. So when, when they want to do a window replacement project, they have a set of specifications and drawings say if you want to replace your windows here's the design for your windows and you can go about contracting somebody to actually do that work so there there can be these design parameters set up for when for somebody who wants to take that that responsibility on for themselves right and, yeah and, excuse me, um, one of the things about the life safety evaluation is uh, the the things that are being asked for in that this you know this evaluation no matter are are not special things over and above the building code so these improvements that these buildings are being asked to to comply with are what how buildings are being built today that those things would be included in buildings today so nobody you know people might feel like they're being penalized a little bit by because they're forced to put in a door closer or uh, a new fire alarm system, uh, but these are actual, basically, improvements that help preserve the value of your condominium. If you if you don't do some of these things, then basically, it's it is is in the today's marketplace. It's it's a sort of a substandard building when you consider all the new buildings have also have these other issues involved with it. So, it's it's a good investment for the long term. It is, you know, and people need to understand the LSE, the matrix itself. Although the original template, I think, started out of Chicago, but it took a couple months and it was with a, with the fire department, Hawaii Council was represented, and um, several other design professionals, it was skewed to match Hawaii buildings. So it's not like this matrix can be used in Florida or California. It's skewed to the Hawaii environment. Yeah. So um, there was a lot of thought, because I know there was a lot of meetings involved in that. Um, it was very time consuming, but I want everybody to realize that this is, it, it was skewed to fit Hawaii buildings, the Hawaii environment. So we're just not taking a template that we got off their internet and, you know, it was best. Right, right. This is not, yeah, exactly. This is not specific to Hawaii by any means. You know, may, many major cities have done this type, same similar thing. So exactly, exactly. Um, so, so we have our seminar on the 24th. I'm really looking forward to it. This has been a seminar that a lot of people have been asking about, um, understanding financial management. So um, I we're supposed to be going through um, some simple terminology on how to read financials. And I really want everybody, board members, to realize that like, when you first see that first set of financials, the, the ledger, and, you know, and you compare it with the budget, I mean, it can be daunting. Your, your eyes kind of have to get adjusted to reading it. So don't feel intimidated. I don't think anybody should feel intimidated that they don't understand it. It's kind of, it takes a little while to skew your eyes to it, you know, um, cause it's a brand new form and you're, you know, you're not used to seeing financial statements, you know? Um, I mean, it's just like when, um, like when Heckle changed the format of their, the way their monthly statements look like, you kind of have to look at it again and make sure you're looking at it correctly. So it just takes an eye adjustment. Um, but we're going to go through some of that. Also, um, a little bit about reserves and the importance of reserves um, and why it's needed, you know, and um, 
it's it's going to be I, I really am looking forward to it i really think the way it's laid out that it's going to be very informative um and i think people will walk away with a better understanding plus a better way that they can explain it to their owners of what the reserves are for and the and part of it is the board responsibility because that was one of the biggest things that was coming out of our surveys um our evaluations is how do we explain to people what you know what the reserves are you know and um i had to explain it to one person i go it's like simply like a household budget you know but it's on a bigger scale but it simply is a household budget um because you got to put money aside like you live in a single family home you got to put money and start putting money aside for a roof because you know roofs last maybe between 15 and 20 years you know depending on the material and and depending on how it's been maintained or even the environment that you live in because if you live on the windward side, the lifespan might be a little bit less compared to, but you know, I don't want to know if I want to compare it to the to Waianae because you have the heat bearing down on it. So that's going to deteriorate it even just as bad. But um, you, you, and it depends um, if you do little things in between that you can maybe stretch out the life. But, um, you know, you need to plan for that. That's a major expense. It could be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 down the road that needs to be start putting away. And, and the big difference is, and correct me if I'm wrong, the big difference between a personal household budget and a condo household budget, you can't just easily go to the bank and get money. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> you know, the, you know we, we, we kind of look at these reserves as, as your sort of your financial tool. In other words, right. This is this is your starting point to be able to to move forward with in, and is that a reliable document? So it's important to understand where these where your your facts and figures come from in these in these particular documents so that you have a, a sense of reliability to those actual numbers because you know when when somebody owners are looking at the this financial statement and saying okay well I see this cost this this cost that that thing and that's reasonable and then we find out that, that the costs weren't even accurate or halfway accurate, that's that's when um, that's when financial planning starts to you know go south on on folks. So there's there's a certain reality that we try to maintain with these reserve studies um, because Hawaii is a, a different marketplace and costs are much different uh, in Hawaii. Fixes are different in Hawaii than on mainland areas. So basically, it, this document really needs to really have a, a, a strong sense of what what's on the islands and how solutions and problems are resolved on the islands and not just an industry standard pull you know pulling a say well it's x number of dollars a square foot for this or that that type of thing so uh, we we bring in our to our reserve study aspects we bring an aspect of these realities of construction because we're also involved in construction so we have that sort of a, a different source of uh, costing information that, that we try to sort of make it more real so that people aren't misled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think we need to start, you know, re, um, instead of just using reserves, try to put, this is your, the reserves is your financing tool or your planning tool. Um, put that word tool in there because really that's what it is, right? You said it. Right. You know, yep. um, it's really a tool and a basis for your, your planning, your finances and the future. Um, and your reserves can have pretty, pretty much every component that you can think of. Um, like, um, I know the reserves don't really allow like for seawalls, but you know what, if you're on the, if you're on the ocean and you have a seawall, it doesn't mean you don't need to put it in there, right? You can add a, add a component if you want to, because seawalls deteriorate over time. Um, I mean, even rock walls can deteriorate. One of mine fell off. <laughs> I have to get the guy to put it back on, you know? So there's other, th you know, you can put in for whatever you want. Just and, and it's a safety net as well to make sure you have those funds when it comes time that you have to repair it. You know, when, when, we, when we look at reserve studies, we don't have to include certain, say, capital improvement projects because, that, because that's a very expensive item to do to do that, but it's very important to understand what those capital improvements are, even though that you're not putting that item into the reserve or planning to fund, try to fund it in some fashion at this point in time, 
because a lot of these improvements are multi-million dollars and there's there's not really a practical way to collect maintenance fees or collect dues to, to towards some of these very expensive items but it's really important to understand what those those particular improvements are so that in down the road we're saying well we know that this is going to cost x number of dollars and then that starts the conversation well how do we plan to go about managing this particular item uh, you know capital improvement is something that is either uh, enhances the, uh, the the value of the property or it it actually um, will say protects the property values so um, these are pretty important discussions to be having alongside of a reserve study so that you know that you know two years from now you might be de need to be dealing with this particular situation and we know how fast time goes you know so it's yeah awesome. Yeah, really. <laughs> and we, I also want to remind everybody that, especially because we started off the conversation with electrical, if you're doing some kind of electrical upgrades, um, make sure you try to check out Hawaii Energy as well for any kind of energy rebates, because that could help offset. I think there was one condo, I think they replaced their boiler on the, on the roof, and they ended up with a $20,000 rebate. Right. And so, then we'll there's, you know, there's a lot of good electrical engineers out there that can help really refine the electrical system of a building in today's modern standards with the idea of photovoltaics, et cetera, to go along with it. So we have a lot of talented, uh, you know, engineers on island. So those folks are, would be, you know, happy to talk to an association about the, you know, what the options are, you know, uh, cool. great for electrical. I didn't realize there were certain ones that kind of you know, specialize in that. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. kind of good to know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there's so many electrical needs in a building and, and when, when you, somebody can, un, when somebody can control all those aspects, then you're going to actually get some significant savings. And with, with software technology today, we can, we're able to do a lot of that. Okay, cool. So I think we're near our ending of our time. So Dennis, I will see you on the 24th with okay. Sean. Yes, you will. With Derek. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm really, I am really, really looking forward to it. Um, the last two weekends with board of director training, it was very, um, <clears throat> was very energetic as well. <clears throat> there was a lot of new board members that are really looking forward to the information that they're going to gain. They already gained the last two weekends. I mean, they were, they were really pleased with that. So we want to kind of continue the momentum um, and the education efforts. Everybody's very appreciative of what Hawaii Council does as far as educating their board members. So um, I shall see you on Thursday, the 24th. Right. Uh, you shall, and I look forward to it. Thank you very much for. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I appreciate you being appreciate here. It. Okay. Great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you guys. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.